Thanks for joining us today for Jennifer Shouts and Associates in our webinar Wednesday program. We are coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They are recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 300 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, so if you have questions for our speaker, we will have his information on the last slide of the presentation today. A special thanks to our educational sponsor, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition, for making these webinars possible. The NBSBC is the largest nonprofit trade association for veterans. Please visit their website for more information. Now a little bit about us. We work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. More information is on our website. We also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach almost 19,000 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pricing information with the email shown on your screen. And now to introduce our speaker, Eric Crucius. Welcome, Eric. We're glad to have you here with us today, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate being here. Um, this topic is always timely, um, which is great um, because we're in an age now where there are a lot of timely topics with COVID-19 uh, uh, changing how government contracting works a little bit. Um, so um, if we go to the next slide. We're talking about um, Prime's subcontracting requirements, and this is a title that can go a lot of different ways. Um, when is a Prime contractor required to subcontract? How are they required to subcontract? And what are the requirements that a Prime contractor has when they're subcontracting to another entity? Um, so we'll cover all of that um, in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, or depending on however long <clears throat> it takes. Um, I always joke that lawyers get paid by the word, so this could go on for a few hours, but uh, and in reality, it won't go on that long. Uh, we'll just give a high level overview that that hopefully will help you issue spot um, uh, as from a prime contractor perspective. Let's go to the next slide. So the, here's our agenda today. We're going to talk some from, about some high level considerations uh, when subcontracting that prime contractors should have. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about, again, from a high level, um, mandatory and permissive flowdowns. Um, when a prime contractor receives a contract, what should be flowed down in that subcontract? Um, then I have uh, put together uh, five tips for effective subcontracting um, that hopefully would be relevant to uh, what you're trying to do out in the marketplace. Um, and this is e even if you're a subcontractor, this is um, good perspective. You know, if you solely work as a subcontractor in the government contracting space, this is actually a terrific view to see what a prime contractor is thinking about when they're when they're trying to. Um, form a relationship with a subcontractor. And then we'll go through some compliance headaches. These are some deep dives on a few topics uh, that we see out there uh, that are impacting this prime sub relationship that I think everyone should know about, no matter whether you're in a position of a prime contractor or subcontractor, or as most contractors in the federal space, both. Where in some co some contracting situations, you're a prime and sub you're, and some you're a subcontractor. Um, so uh, good perspective there. And then just on the last topic, when must a prime contractor subcontract? There are times when um, a prime contractor has to subcontract, and we'll just talk a little bit uh, from a high level uh, on those times. Let's go to the next slide. So our first topic that we're talking today about today is subcontracting considerations. Um, I hate to make everything about COVID-19, um, but it's out there, and we should just talk about it. There are a lot of new contractors in the federal marketplace over the last few months. Um, in fact, there are so many that DOD put out guidance about what a company should do if they want to become a government contractor that's on their website. Um, and, uh, you know, you could reach out to me and I can give you that address. But um, that means that there are a lot of companies out there that aren't used to government contracting. Um, and when you're a prime contractor and you're trying to pick your subcontractors to, to help with an effort that you have, um, it makes it more difficult if you're dealing with companies that haven't been in the government space before. So one thing to think about under this kind of how well do you know your subcontractor, um, also how well do you know whether your subcontractor has done government contracting work before. And you could do you could search the usual databases um, such as FPDS, USA Spending, all that kind of stuff um, until they all move over to uh, beta.sam.gov. But um, you know. It doesn't give a perspective on whether there could be a contractor that's never really had a government contract 
um, but has been a very effective subcontractor for decades. And they just, for whatever reason, they don't want to become a, a prime contractor. So, um, you know, the, you know, one, the first thing to think about is how well do you know the subcontractor? This is more of um, a marriage than dating, as I like to say. I didn't want to put that in the slide, but it really is more, more like a marriage because you're, you're in this together as a prime and sub. If there are issues that the subcontractor has, it's going to redound to the prime contractor. Um, so just some things to think about, and this is pretty basic stuff, but it's always good to re be reminded you have a contract, you have an effort, you want to get a subcontractor on board very quickly. There's a rush to do that oftentimes, and sometimes these things um, get kind of left on the, on the side of the road, yet they do come back if um, the subcontractor has issues. So it's really good to think about this up front. Um, what kind of research has, has a prime contractor done about the compliance or the work history of a subcontractor? Um, you know, have you checked to make sure that they're not debarred or proposed for debarment or suspended or things like that? Um, have you looked in databases to see whether, you know, there are outstanding judgments against them? These are all kind of some basic uh, hy hygiene things that you can do on a subcontractor to make sure that they don't have a history littered with issues. I've represented a lot of clients where, um, you know, they would have saved a lot of heartache had they, had they done some basic research up front about their subcontractors uh, or proposed subcontractors. So uh, kind of doing that research is, is really helpful. It can save a lot of time and money in the long run. So the next thing to think about, and this this is something you, I often think about and talk with clients about when negotiating a subcontract agreement, but who has that power in the relationship between the prime and the sub? You know, from a, from a high level perspective, when you think about it, oftentimes it's the prime that seems to have all the power because they're bringing the sub into the fold and the sub is reliant on the prime, um, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not always the case. Um, so, you know, understanding that power dynamic is helpful when negotiating a prime sub arrangement because the more power a subcontractor has, the more power they have to push back on terms that they think is unfair in the prime sub uh, in the subcontract agreement. So, you know, some some thing, considerations when, when thinking about how much power they have, does the subcontractor offer a unique skill? Um, uh, for uh, the work that's being done, are they the only one or one of only a few companies that has the skill and the government's asking for the skill? Um, has the uh, prime contractor proposed or specifically named the subcontractor in the um, proposal? Are, are key personnel from the proposal employees of the subcontractor? These are all factors that can raise the subcontractor's uh, power within that power dynamic between the prime and the sub. And um, that doesn't change the fact that the prime contractor has certain responsibilities that they have to do within their subcontract agreement, but it's certainly um, certainly on the margins when negotiating those agreements can change uh, how those negotiations go. Is the subcontractor directed by the federal government? Obviously, if they are, that changes the power dynamic drastically. If the, if the government is saying, hey, you're going to hire the subcontractor to do this work, which happens sometimes, um, then um, that gives the the uh, subcontractor a lot more leverage to um, negotiate terms into a subcontract agreement that are less favorable to the prime contractor. Um, here's another, is the prime contractor dependent on the subcontractor for a lot of its work? So, you know, we often think of prime, con you know, folks unfamiliar with the space, government contracting space, will probably normally think that the prime contractor is always the biggest company and the subcontractor is always a smaller company that hasn't graduated to be a prime contract yet. But on the contrary, that's not often the case uh, where you have, uh, for instance, set aside work where this, where the prime contractor has to be a small business. Um, and the prime contractor is a large company that, um, is, you know, subcontracts because they want to get a piece of the work. Um, maybe perhaps the subcontractor uses this prime contractor all over, um, you know, throughout um or vice versa you know if one company is dependent on the other for a lot of its work um, that can change the power dynamics in the relationship so uh some things to think about there uh, when considering how to negotiate that prime sub arrangement let's go to the next slide so um one thing you know of course the the one aspect um that we always think about in the prime sub or in the subcontract agreement are flow downs. They, they are a uh, mainstay of prime sub agreements. Um, 
and there are going to be flow downs of some kind. Now, there are two types of flow downs. There are mandatory flow downs, of course, and permissive flow downs. And I know some of you, a lot of you are probably familiar with those terms and the, uh, the, idea, beside flow, the idea behind flow downs, but some things to think about. One, um, mandatory flow downs, um, there's no you know, you could you could search in the on the interwebs and find and search for mandatory flowdowns far, and you'll find some websites that have mandatory flowdowns, right? Some things to think about though. Um, not ma the mandatory flowdowns aren't always mandatory, um, depending on the type of contract you have. So, what will be a mandatory flowdown in one contract won't be a mandatory flowdown in a different contract, and that will depend be dependent highly dependent on whether for instance, it's for commercial products or services. It will be dependent on the size of the procurement. You know, the flow down requirements increase as generally as the size of the procurements go up. Um, what type of procurement is it? Is it firm fixed price? Is it a cost type contract? Um, that will change the uh, the types of flow downs that are required. Um, and also, you know, sometimes the clause as a whole must be flowed down. Sometimes something like the clause has to be flowed down. Sometimes the title is sufficient. All those things are things um, for reasons why just looking at a chart about what's mandatory is not really enough. Um, so that's all to say is that mandatory flow downs are, are not always mandatory depending on the type of contract you have. Sometimes um, you know they, they vary on, dependent on contracts. So unfortunately that takes quite a bit of work. I mean, there's a few ways to play this, right? Um, because you have these permissive flow downs which aren't required to be flow down. Um, you could flow down everything. Um, when I say you, your company, or um, everything can be flowed down to a subcontractor. You know, that's the easiest thing to do, right? Of course, that gives a lot of subcontractors heartache because they see all these clauses and they may not have to abide by them. So I see different companies take different tacks. Some you know, we'll just flow everything down and, and set it and forget it. And then if the subcontractor comes back and says, you know, I don't think X is applicable to me, they'll look at it and say, okay, you're right, and take it out. Or they'll take the time and effort and money to winnow down the, the flow down um, clauses, the clauses that need to be flowed down and figure out uh, what does and doesn't um, to kind of uh, hem the subcontract to be ultra specific to that, to that, um, to that opportunity. I'm not saying one is better than the other because they both have pluses and minuses, but those are two tacks to take. So um, how do you know if a clause, uh, it's a question I get a lot, is mandatory or permissive or shouldn't be flow down? It will usually say it in the, uh, there's two places to look and a lot of places it will say in the clause itself. Um, <clears throat> so you can see here under subsection E of this clause, and I believe I took this from, you know, memory escapes me, I believe I took it from a cybersecurity clause. Um, so, um, you know, it says here, subcontractors, the contractor shall insert the substance of this clause, including subparagraph E, so this clause, and all subcontracts and other contractual instruments, including subcontracts, for the acquisition of commercial items. So this, this kind of um, telegraphs two things. One, um, this has to be flowed down, and two, this clause, this subclause, subsection E, has to be flowed down as well, meaning that it should be flowed down throughout the supply chain. It's kind of in perpetuity. As you insert this clause, it's got to be flowed down and, and vice versa. Um, and then sometimes you could see at the very top of a clause, uh, it'll say, pursuant to X, um, insert this in the contract or subcontract or whatever it is, insert this into the contract. And when you click on X, uh, or, or look up that provision, it sometimes will mention if it should be in subcontracts or not. So there's two places to really look to see if a particular clause should be inserted. And as you go along and get more familiar with this, you'll, you'll know certain clauses should and should not be um, you know, as, a, as a rote, but it does take time to kind of go through um, uh, a, a, a flow downs and, and figure out whether they need to be flow down uh, or not. And as it says here in this bottom point, it's highly dependent on the service or product being provided. Um, so it just depends on the amount of the subcontract or the contract. It, it, there's a lot of variables. So I, I just caution against lists that say these are all the mandatory flow downs because we just, it just is very dependent on the contract or for service or product being offered. Let's go to the next slide. So now we're going to move on to five tips for effective subcontracting. Um, and some of these you probably already do. Some maybe you've thought of, some you don't do, but don't think of. Um, 
but these are these are things to think about. One, and this is um, sometimes pretty obvious, but I've seen subcontracts without them after the fact, not ones that I've helped draft, hopefully, but always be able to terminate for convenience as a prime contractor. Um, the last thing a prime contractor needs is not to be able to terminate for convenience and uh, then stuck with the subcontractor services or products and no one to sell them to. Now, with a lot of you know, in times of economic crisis or economic uh, downturns or however you want to term what we're going through now, there's not really words to describe it. Um, you have um, situations where, like I said, there are a lot of commercial companies that are in the marketplace now and they don't know, you know, terminations for convenience are really something that's that's mostly within the government contracting space. You don't see it really in the commercial contracting world um, that very much. Um, so this may be a provision that a lot of commercial companies are unfamiliar with. So when if you're negotiating with a subcontractor that's a commercial contractor, you may need to kind of give them an education on the idea behind the termination for convenience, why it's in there and why it's necessary. Because at any point in time, the government can come in and terminate a prime contract for convenience. It's just the way, you know, it's 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 a life that we leave here and lead in here in the government contracts industry. And the prime contractor has to have that ability to do that to the subcontractors to be able to terminate them or at least hold off on um, on what they're uh, providing. Um, because there are you know instances of a stop work order or descoping, things like that. Um, the primes always got to be able to tell the sub to turn off the spigot. And in turn, the sub should be able to do that to their subs and so on down the line. Um, this is always a, a point of negotiation in a prime sub relationship. You know, can the prime terminate this for convenience for any reason? Um, can, you know, that's the, that's obviously the most favorable to the prime contractor, but there are some that are also can be team term fair to a prime contractor that are less, um, broad, uh, from a, from the prime contractor's perspective. Um, maybe if the subcontractor's work is terminated, that's the only instance when, uh, a termination for convenience would be, would be had. So, it gives the prime contractor a little less power to just terminate for convenience willy-nilly. It's connect directly connected with the work that the subcontractor is doing. And that's often where I see these things end up. Uh, with less sophisticated subcontractors, they may uh, accept, or ones that have more power, um, they may, you know, they or less power, I should say, they may accept termination for convenience under any circumstances, but um, really, um, you know, Oftentimes, subcontractors will push back on that and say, hey, if our work is canceled, you could terminate us for convenience, but no other reason why. So that's the first tip. Um, one, um, tip number two, not to blindly flow down clauses in a prime contract. And that's this is important. And this kind of goes to our last slide when we we're talking about um, flow downs. Um, it's easy to just kind of take the package of, of, of flow downs and, or or FAR and, D, and DFARs and other agency clauses and just put them in the subcontract and forget about it. That's true. Um, before doing that, I would urge a prime contractor to look at the clauses that are in there and ensure that all the clauses that should be in there are in there. There's a doctrine called the Christian doctrine, obviously not a religious doctrine. It's based off of a case called GL Christian and Associates. And it stood for the proposition that um, there are some clauses so innate to government contracting, they're gonna be read into a government contract whether they're in there or not. Termination for convenience, as we just talked about, is one of those. And um, let's just say you have no termination for convenience clause in your prime contract because the government forgot to put it in and then you just float, dutifully flow down every clause. All of a sudden, you don't have a termination for convenience um, option in your subcontract agreement if you haven't separately written one in. So um, what I would do is just look at those clauses that are the most important, have a list of those perhaps, and to you, and flow them down or put them in your subcontract agreements, whether they're flow down or they're in a list of flow downs or not, whether they're in that list of FAR and DFARs or if it's a DOD contract or other agency clauses or not, to ensure that um, everything is getting down to the subcontractor that should, even if it's not in the prime contract itself. Let's go to the next slide. The tip number three we're gonna talk about is, is being aware of vague terms. Um, whenever drafting a subcontract, it's really important to draft it, assuming that it's gonna to go to litigation um, or there'll be some kind of dispute. 99% of the time, there's not gonna be dispute and everything's gonna be just fine. Even if it's not perfectly fine, 
the parties will find a way through you know issues that arise because inevitably things do come up. Um, it's very rare that it kind of leads to litigation or even the threat of litigation down the road. But um, I've been involved in too many prime sub disputes that are pre litigation and during litigation with vague terms that the parties are dealing with to know that it's really important to kind of say what you mean and mean what you say in this in this uh, subcontract agreement. I've I've heard sometimes we'll just worry about that down the road, right? We let's not negotiate over that point anymore. And that's a dangerous path to go down because if the parties can't agree or can't agree enough to make it the terms defined now, when the rubber hits the road, it's going to get even worse. So really kind of <clears throat> rooting out those uh, potential disagreements, getting put, putting pen to paper in a very clear and succinct way that can be not left to interpretation uh, is really important. Getting rid of vague terms in a contract can save literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees down the road. So really draft like draft like the contract is going to be sued over and the party's intentions are clear. I know that's a tough way to kind of think about things because everything seems so good in the beginning usually, but it's really important to kind of um, understand that because I think it'll save a lot of heartache down the road. Um, Tip number four, subcontracts are commercial contracts. I think a lot of people don't realize that. These are not government contracts. The interpretation of the contract agreements between the primes and the subs are handled in federal or state court, not the Court of Federal Claims, not the Board of Contract Appeals, um, not at GAO. So, you know, drafting so a judge or a jury can understand the terms is also helpful too. This kind of goes, <coughs> excuse me, with term tip number three, um, you know, Obviously, contracts are, um, have to have some legalese in them. Uh, otherwise, all the lawyers would be out of business. <laughs> but um, you know, trying to draft them in a clear manner so that way a potential jury or judge can understand them is really is really helpful. These things, like tip number three and tip number four, um, are ways to save lots of money down the road or heartache down the road. Um, they take just a little bit of time up front. But they're, you know, they can be really helpful um, when you get to a, a potential dispute. Even if it never goes to litigation or a threat of litigation, it really helps get get uh, parties on the right path uh, if they're having a dispute. And let's go to the next slide. So, tip number five. I want to say, as it says at the very end of this tip, this is not an exhaustive list. So don't take this. Please don't take this slide, copy it and say, all right, these are the clauses that we need in our subcontract. These are examples of clauses I think that are important. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, but these are clauses I think that are most of which or all of which should be in every subcontract agreement. Uh, first, the termination for convenience clause we spoke about, uh, stop work clause. So not necessarily termination, but you know, you get a stop work order from the government. You need to be able to pass that down um, to um, a subcontractor and also, there are certain uh, times that a subcontractor needs to just accept new clauses. For instance, and we're going to talk about this in a minute for the Service Contract Act, now called Service Contract Labor Standards. Um, there are new wage determinations that come out. The prime has to be able to put those in the subcontract. So there are things like that um, that you want to maybe draft that termination or 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 clause or modification clause to kind of include those things as well. Um, Intellectual property, um, IP, we have to understand what IP the parties are coming to the table with, what IP is kind of background IP, what IP, what happens to the IP that's created within the scope of the contract, who does it belong to, who has a license to it, all that kind of stuff. As a prime contractor, you want to ensure that you have the intellectual property necessary to perform the contract, um, full stop. So um, that's that's the first thing. Second, having, having an idea of what happens to the IP that is um, created and brought to the table is also uh, of importance as well. You also want a merger clause, which essentially stands for the proposition that all the parties' intentions are in this document. Um, so five years from now, somebody can't come and say, well, we talked about X before the contract was signed and, and the other side agreed to X. This merger clause will hopefully prevent that, but that says all the parties' intentions are in this document. And then of course, choice of law and venue, what law, what state's law is this contract interpreted by? Uh, what's the venue? Where where would a lawsuit or or um, an arbitration take place? You also I should note you know if there's forced arbitration within the scope in the agreement that should be mentioned as well. 
um, and uh, which arbitrating association or which arbitration organization would handle that. Um, notice is, is of course important. Um, who gets notified if there's a change or an issue or a potential termination? Um, both parties should have notices. <clears throat> uh, usually I see a person's name mentioned in the notice and that's fine, but um, there should be an alternative or a position mentioned. So that way, if that person's no longer at the company, you don't have to modify the contract to change the person's name. Um, so it may be send it to subcontractor um, administrator at this address with this email address, maybe have a generic email address that all subcontract um, notes, you know, emails go to, or a copy to the outside counsel or inside counsel that's, that's um, um, so that they will get notice of whatever it is and they can uh, bring the client into the fold. Um, so notice is, is very important. And the method of notice too, is it an email? Is it uh, FedEx? Is it uh, overnight certified? That kind of stuff. Uh, Anti-assignment subcontracting. So there are clauses that oftentimes prevent a, a subcontractor from assigning the contract to somebody else or subcontracting out certain parts of the work um, to the extent that that's necessary. Those should be in there. Um, Anti-poaching. Um, this is an area of a little bit of controversy that DOJ got involved in a few years ago, but um, you know, having having some kind of clause that's consistent with the law that does not allow the parties to poach their employees from each other. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, that's very helpful. Of course, you want to have the rates and the price and the scope of work in there, all those kind of nuts and bolts of performing their work. When pay invoicing and payments do, uh, what kind of invoices is necessary, um, are necessary, where are they sent to? How is payment triggered? Is it is it triggered when the when the government pays? Is it triggered when the when the invoice, you know, it's X number of days after the government pays, X number of days after payment from the government is received, like I said, or is it X number of days after the invoice is sent? Um, there's a, a number of things to, to uh, trigger that uh, payment date. So you want to see which one is appropriate, and of course there have been new, uh, there's been new guidance that has come out, have come out from a few different agencies that have, have required quicker payments to subcontract or to small businesses. So you also want to kind of keep keep an eye on that too to see if it overrides uh, what the parties have agreed to in their prime sub agreement. Then you have inspection and warranty clauses. You know when when is something accepted? What happens if something goes wrong uh, with whatever has been provided? Uh, similarly, indemnity, if there's an issue, will the other party indemnify uh, for the wrongs that they've committed and, and, and those indemnities, are they, is it a duty to defend, is it a duty to pay damages, that kind of stuff. Uh, and part and parcel with that is a limitation of liability. Uh, if there's an issue, uh, what damages um, would be available to, what kinds of damages would be available to the other side. Then we have the force majeure clause, which I think more people are familiar with today than have been in decades. And that's when there's an act of God, so to speak, as it's called in contracts. Um, what happens then? A pandemic and quarantine situation usually um, is in a force majeure clause. There are standard force majeure clauses in government contracts, and then the parties can negotiate their own force majeure clauses in the prime sub uh, arrangement. They vary quite a bit. So just because um, you know, not every force majeure clause is equal, so just be aware of that. Then who gets to communicate with the government and when? Um, when we have audit rights, can the can a contractor come in and audit the subcontractor? And then cybersecurity requirements, uh, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So let's go to the next slide. So this section is uh, are the compliance headaches. Um, the first one is the Service Contract Act, uh, commonly known uh, or now known as the Service Contract Labor Standards. And um, you know this is why. Uh, who your subcontractor is from a prime contractor perspective is really important because if a subcontractor violates the Service Contract Act, um, the prime contractor is jointly and severally liable for that violation. So any kind of enforcement proceeding or damages paid to the employees uh, uh, to the subcontractor can be brought upon the prime contractor as well. What typically happens, however, is that DOL will look at the situation and say, all right, the prime contractor did everything right here. They flow down the SCA clause. They flow down the correct wage determination. They told, you know, may, perhaps they, they required <coughs> the um, subcontractor to certify 
in the subcontract agreement that they're compliant with the Service Contract Act and that if they fell out of compliance, they'd let the prime contractor know. That's a good thing to do. Um, you know, they did prime contract did, did all those things. So that what the DOL typically does, it's not the same in every situation, was they'll go to the subcontractor and, and enforce enforce the wrongs against the subcontractor. However, if the subcontractor goes bankrupt, it doesn't pay, they'll be coming to the prime contractor for that money, even though the prime contractor has not necessarily done anything wrong. And the basis of that is this uh, CFR clause 29.4.114 that holds um, the primes and subs jointly and severally liable for any uh, subcontractor misdeeds. Um, so very important to keep an eye on that as you go along in your subcontracting relationship. Let's go to the next slide. And of course, everyone is talking about cybersecurity today. Uh, um, and why not? Because a lot is changing the cybersecurity field. Um, we have, of course, a FAR clause, cyber FAR clause, which is pretty easy to comply with, relatively speaking. On the DOD side, we have DFARS 252-204-7012 involving the safeguarding of covered defense information. And, of course, the new requirement, uh, CMMC, um, Jennifer Schaus and Associates had a whole series of uh, on, on CMMC a few months back. Um, but, um, you know, obviously this this stuff is required to be flowed down. CMMC is not finalized yet. Of course, they have they had 1.02 come out uh, recently, which was just a, some minor corrections to 1.0, which came out at the end of January on the CMMC level. But each contractor um, over time will be required, and subcontractor will be required to get a CMMC certification. Um, and the level that is required, there'll be five levels, but the level is required is dependent on the kind of work that the contractor and subcontractor is doing. So for all those folks who want to continue to do business with the federal government or specifically the Department of Defense as a prime or a subcontractor will need to have a CMMC certification. We are expecting a proposed DFARS rule that will come out any day now that will have more information about the CMMC certification requirements and will probably combine itself with the 7012 clause you see just above uh, in this slide. But here's the wrinkle here. DOD in its, in its a contract or RFP will say what CMMC level is required to perform the work on the contract. Now, if a contractor has a disagreement with that level, they can go and file a pre-award protest. But let's just say DOD says it's a level four required to perform the work on the contract. And luckily for you, you have your company has a level four CMMC certification, so you're all good to go. Although the certification is not required until the contract's awarded, but that's a whole nother story. Um, but then you have subcontractors. What level is required for the subcontractors um, and who determines that? And that's a little bit unclear right now, but it may be, we may fall to the prime contractor to determine what level the subcontractor is required to have in the CMMC certification. So yeah, if, if that's the case, the prime contractors be very careful about what, you know, about assigning out those levels and documenting that decision. Um, the, the level that's required may be, will probably be dependent on what kind of information the subcontractor is handling. If the subcontractor is going to have access to every system that the prime does and all the information the prime does, then they'll probably need the same level. But to the extent that it's a little bit stovepiped, uh, the level requirement might be lower, but they will be a level requirement. Every contractor and subcontractor uh, will be required to have a CMMC certification except those selling COTS products. Um, besides that, though, everyone's going to need one. Let's go to the next slide. So another headache is our new supply chain requirements. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, this in the recent years, but just to really touch on it, um, in the 2018 NDAA, uh, Congress banned Kaspersky Lab products and services, all of them, <clears throat> that would turn into a uh, clause um, that must be flowed down to subcontractors. It prohibits the use of Kaspersky Lab products and services. Um, section 889 a year later in the 2019 NDA, and I should mention Kaspersky did file a lawsuit in um, challenging this provision and was unsuccessful, and the appeal was unsuccessful also. Section 889 of the 2019 NDAA, which was a partial ban of products and services from certain Chinese companies or Chinese-based companies such as Huawei and ZTE, Hikavision. Um, Right now, the regulations are you can't provide these products or services to the federal government within a deliverable, but new regulations that we expect to become coming out soon, that will be effective in August, will not allow, at least the way this NDA was written, will not allow the possession of those products or services. 
So if you have, for instance, a security camera made by one of those companies in one of your factories, that would be a no-go. You can't certify that you're not using those products and services. So obviously it's a provision that we're, we're anxiously waiting to see what the regulations say, but it could be uh, very dangerous for contractors. Um, this is a certification requirement and it must be flowed down. So this is a potential headache, um, especially if your if you're, um, subcontractor is a large business that has um, offices or factories around the world. And then you have the Federal Acquisition Supply Chain Security Act of 2018. This actually created the Federal Acquisition Security Council. Um, so I should mention that Huawei challenged this ban um, in the 2019 NDAA. The challenge was unsuccessful. Um, it is, I believe, on appeal right now, so we'll see what happens. And uh, obviously, Congress saw that this was not the best way to go about what, what they were doing here by just kind of these one-off provisions in the NDA that ban certain products and services. So they created this, this uh, Federal Acquisition Security Council from this act. Um, and the council is then is supposed to evaluate products, services, and companies to see whether they should be banned or not. They have other tasks as well. But they're, you know, one of the tests important for this presentation is that. Um, and the companies that are, are kind of brought to task have the power to then challenge that in, in, within the council itself and then in court if need be. But uh, something to keep in mind as you, um, as you work with various subcontractors. Let's, let's um, go to the next slide. Something else that new that's happened. And the, these kinds of things kind of go against the general tenor of kind of making it easier to do business with the federal government. Obviously, um, you know, there's a rush to do business with the federal government based on the current uh, economic situation. And, uh, and the fact that the government's spending so much money right now, but um, there are certain barriers in place, such as these things. I'm not saying they're not necessary; they're just there. Um, um, so to be aware of, especially when negotiating with a subcontractor and thinking about your relationship with the subcontractor. Um, this is the Procurement Collusion Strike Force. This was started on November 5th, 2019. Although um, I was at an ABA meeting in San Diego back when I used to travel <laughs> at the end of October. And, uh, and they announced it there as well. Um, but they're looking, DOJ believes, uh, right or wrongly, there's a lot of collusion happening between government contractors. So they've created this strike force. It's really a combination of federal, state, local officials, uh, US attorneys from around the country. Um, and they're looking for collusion. They're looking for red flags of collusion, such as um, the communications with competitors, uh, some you know, teaming and between competitors, um, proposal withdrawals, things like that. Um, so just something to think about as you negotiate with your subcontractor. This is this is really a prime contractor requirement. When you're talking with or negotiating with your subcontractor, think about how this would um, look to the procurement collusion strike force if they uncovered what you were saying. Um, ensure that there is real competition um, and that the idea of of subbing, and I get it. Sometimes there there is an idea that you sub with your competitor or you enter a relationship with your competitor to kind of help ensure that you're going to get the work. But there is a line that 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 is crossed sometimes. So just something to think about with the procurement collusion strike force. Let's go to the next slide, which I think has become especially relevant: uh, rated orders under the Defense Production Act. Um, so this is a required flow down that you don't normally think about in the in the parlance of flow down requirements. But you know, if a company gets a rated order uh, under the Defense Production Act, meaning that they have to give priority to um, certain products and um, certain contracts, I should say, assigned by the federal government, um, you have to, as a prime contractor, flow that priority rating down the subcontracting chain all the way to the bottom of the chain. So um, before accepting, so just because a company gets a um, an award from the federal government with the priority rating in it doesn't mean that the, you know, if it's not solicited, you know, if you haven't put in an RFP saying you can do X, the government just says, I want X because we have an emergency right now. It doesn't mean that the uh, contractor, proposed contractor has to say yes. They have to see whether they can fulfill that requirement. Part of that is going down the supply chain and making sure that the products and services are available um, to be um, gotten. So the so that you can meet the government's deadline. If you can't meet the government de government's deadline, the contractor is required to say no to the government, but then propose an alternative schedule that can work. So this requires going down the supply chain, going down to subcontractors and seeing what their abilities are. And then once you accept the work as a prime contractor, flowing it all the way down, the, that rating all the way down the supply chain. So if there's ever an issue, 
your work can be prioritized in accordance with the rating that's given. There's two levels of ratings, DO and DX, DX being higher than DO, DO being higher than unrated, um, unrated uh, orders. Let's go to the next slide. Failure to perform. This is a big headache, of course, and it's wrapped up into a lot of, a lot of what we already spoke about, but the failure to perform is, um, it, you know, is something that plagues that prime sub relationship over and over again uh, when the subcontractor does not perform. This obviously impacts the performance of the prime contractor and the ability of the prime contractor to be able to get a satisfactory rating, maybe in the CPARs or something like that. So in the end, the prime contractor is ultimately responsible to the government for its performance. And that is part and parcel with the subcontractor's performance. That's why I didn't mention this, but um, those termination clauses should also include a termination for default. So if a subcontractor is not performing, the prime contractor can go off and find a new subcontractor that can perform in a way consistent with what the prime contractor's expectations are. Uh, COVID-19 has, has raised the possibility of non-performance, of course, um, as um, folks are unable to get to their workplace, maybe people have been sick, um, all those kinds of things, maybe materials are not available um, because of supply chain issues, all those kinds of things have contributed to subcontractors' inability to perform. So, you know, thinking about those situations when drafting that subcontract agreement is important, and COVID-19 has uh, raised this possibility, of course. But of course, the, there's a force majeure clause, as we spoke about earlier. What does that say? What does it allow the prime contractor to, to do? Um, most force majeure clauses, not all of them, but a lot of them will have a provision in it that says, we can't terminate you for a default, but we give you five, 10 days to comply. And if we could find somebody else who can do it, we're going to find them and we're going to have them do it. And that's similar to what the federal government's rights are vis-a-vis -vis the prime contractor as well. And of course, if there's an issue with performance or an issue you believe is coming up, having those communications with the subcontractor, and if you think it will impact overall performance on the contract, having those communications with the government customer are really important. It, you know, a lot can be said for having communication ahead of time before there are issues um, or before issues become, you know, uh, really terrible um, and, and really throw things behind the eight ball. And let's go to the next slide. Finally, about when is subcontracting requirement required? So, there are a few instances where subcontracting may be required um, by the prime contractor. First, um, large prime contractors have to submit a subcontracting plan uh, under that FAR provision 52219-9 for contracts over $700,000. And the prime contractor has to abide by that plan. So that requires subcontracting. <laughs> you know, the, you have to abide by the plan that you propose. Sometimes, um, Prime contractors put a subcon specify subcontractors in their proposal if allowed to or required to. Um, that might be a scenario then where you're essentially, as a prime contractor, required to subcontract with that company. Um, and then the th or third instance is that if there are key personnel, kind of similar to the second instance, but if there are key pers personnel in a proposal and those personnel are employees of a subcontractor that may require a prime contractor to to um, contract with the subcontractor. These are all things that kind of impact the power of the relationship between the prime and the sub, of course, um, something to think about there. And uh, I, let's go to the next slide. And with that, um, I really appreciate everyone's time today. This, is, of course, is a high level overview. We could cover this for really a full day if we went into the nuts and bolts of it. But uh, I hope this kind of helps you issue spot some, some things in a prime sub relationship and the requirements that a prime contractor has uh, one subcontracting out work under a government contract. Thank you, Eric, for a great presentation today and sharing your time with us. And thank you to everyone who joined us. The recording will be on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Please join us this Friday as we cover each part of the FAR and join us next Wednesday for more hot topics from federal contracting.